There's people in the congregation tonight full of pain, and hurt, or there's depression, or fear. But I've got good news for you. The Bible says that in Jesus' presence, in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. Yes. Yes. So when we're in his presence, he's here. I brought him with me. I didn't have to invite him or pray him down. And so the good news is, if you came in lost, sick, depressed, or burned down, you can leave free. Yes. You don't have to leave the same way that you came. Isn't that good news? It's good to have my pastor here, and Brother Kevin, and my beautiful wife, both daughters, best friend Donnie and Carly, friends for years here tonight. And amongst, it's always good to be amongst family members. Amen. 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 I'd like to read one scripture to start this testimony. is really, it's not a testimony of, I haven't ever spent time in prison, never stuck a needle in my arm. But this testimony is a testimony of how God called somebody and had his hand on him from birth. Called him to preach, got discouraged, took my eyes off the Savior for a period of time, and chased the things of the world looking to fill that hole. I got news for you. Nothing will ever fill it. There's not a drug. There's not a pill. There's not an alcohol. There's not a pornographic movie or anything. They'll ever fill that. I've lived on both sides of the fence. I know. In Psalms 18 and 6, one of my testimony scriptures I'll always use, it says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he heard me. Out of his temple, and my cry came to his ears. I am the firstborn of four children, the parents that lived together for about seven years. <clears throat> they parted when I was seven years old, and it was hard as a seven year old child to have dad and mom split. I lived in a very unstable home. I lived here with my mother, some, and some with my dad, but the Lord was with me. And used to speak to me, even I can remember as a seven-year-old child. You see, I had a Holy Ghost-filled grandmother on my dad's side, and all she ever did was pray for her children and her grandchildren. She would take me to church with her, and occasionally I'd even spend the night. And I can remember how boring it was. <laughs> and how dull it seemed at seven and eight years old because... All Mama Marlo did was pray and played an old cassette player with gospel tapes. And she had a TV, but it was never on. And I can remember her tucking me in and saying a prayer with me. And then I'd hear her for hours crying out for her children and grandchildren, literally crying. And so the word of God was being sown into my heart at a very young age. In my teenage years, I was rebellious. I quit school at 16, worked jobs here and there, drank and partied most all the time. Was in situations that I really never should have made it out of. But the Lord was with me, and he had a plan. Psalms 139 says, he knows my down setting and my uprising. He's acquainted with my ways and understands the very thought and intent of my heart. I can remember being at a mall as a teenager hanging out with friends. One night, the mall was the big hangout in 1988. And we were looking, me and the guys I was running with were looking for some girls to ride around with us. And we ran into a couple of Christian girls, and they said, well, you can ride around with us on one condition. You'll go to church with us in the morning. So I looked at my buddy, and I said, ah, we can do that. God had a plan, didn't he? As we began attending services with them, the Lord started convicting me of sin and dealing with me on how to get my heart right. I refused at first, and I can remember being under conviction at those services and fighting. Has anybody ever fought? The conviction of God, your palms are sweating and your heart's racing, and you just don't want to let go. And one of the key points there was we was at a get-together at a Christian person's house that night. 
And I started having the first uh, panic attack that I'd ever had. And the first one, it really scared me. So he's on his way to the emergency room with me. And we topped the hill of his little Nissan pickup truck and sideswiped another car. It was probably running 110 or 15, and we all walked out of it. And I was shook up, so we went to the hospital, and I told the little triage nurse what had happened and how I had been feeling my life was a wreck. And she said, son, and she smiled, and she said, don't you think God's dealing with you? And so a light clicked on. And the following Sunday night, the conviction set in really heavy, and at the end of the service, I went to the altar and gave my heart to Jesus. And this was in 1990. And I'll never forget how it felt like a weight had been lifted and burdens removed. Has anybody ever felt that besides me? Amen. Now, I had been at that time dating someone that wasn't a believer and had no intentions of getting saved at that time. I was wanting to live by God's ways, and she didn't quite understand that. And while we couldn't be doing and hanging out the places that we used to do, I mean, you know, when you become a Christian, old things are passed away, right. and all things become new. Yeah. Because I'm saved now, and so we got married. Her dad had to sign for it. She was 16, and I was 18. And shortly thereafter, she too was born again. We attended a church of God in Powder Springs. She became pregnant with my firstborn, Caleb. I, at that time, was called to preach, called into the ministry. I played drums in church, taught Sunday school, served the Lord with gladness and joy. And about two years into it, the marriage began to fail. Things happened, and it was completely over. And I was shattered. Because, you know, when you, when you do everything right, and it still falls apart, you have questions, and you wonder why. So God healed me, and he was with me, and I moved forward, continued working for the Lord, but I was on a mission to find a wife. I don't want to do it alone. You know, I don't have that gift. Paul said some men have the gift of being alone, and that's not me. I wanted to help me. So I went to church and continued doing God's work, and then I met my son's mother. We dated for about six months, and we got married in the church. We had a minister together through Safe House Outreach in Atlanta, a runaway home for teenagers, deliverance, and a healing ministry. I was a chaplain at a hospital, visiting the sick, praying, preaching wherever God opened the doors. And after about eight or nine years, lots of things happened, and we grew apart. And in that, I started beginning to get discouraged. And I stopped reading my Bible, stopped praying, and then a little bit of the time, the church attendance stopped. But the Lord was with me. After counseling and counseling, she wanted to separate. I was absolutely not in agreement with that. But nevertheless, we don't control everything. The devil had a trap set. And he's got a trap set for each and every one of you. But just always remember, when you surrender your heart to Christ, that's like people told me after my, I'm going on this, the end of this month, I'll be six months, delivered and sober. Amen. Rededicate Thank myself Lord. back to Thank the Lord. Lord. And I will say that it has not been a struggle at all. Because the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. So if I'm yoked up to Jesus and I, when I gave him my heart and I surrendered myself to him, it's not hard anymore. So I know every, different people struggle with different things, but here's the thing. The Bible says to be not weary in well-doing. After my church attendance stopped at that time, I became weary. I had lived for God, served others, was a giver, preached, raised my children right, and it was gone. Have you ever wondered why? Mm -hmm. The ministry was gone, family was broken, 
and I was angry and broken, but God never left me. I started, I went pretty much full force back out in the world, and for the first time in, since 1990, I went and had me a beer. At this time, I'm away from God. I'm not attending church. And this is the trap that the enemy set that I walked into. Let me say this. Jesus said the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He, Jesus told Simon Peter that Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And he won't stop until you take your last breath. But Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Come on. I'm going to walk in that abundant life. I made my mind up August 27th to live under the shadow of the Almighty Amen. and stop compromising and playing games with God. It's a dangerous thing to do that. And because I have prayed family and a wife that wouldn't give up on me, that's why I'm standing here today Amen. and not in the cemetery. I believe that. Amen. That's right. Give Jesus a hand clap. So I went out into the world drinking and partying and got married a couple more times. And, you know, God would deal with me and talk to me and show me dreams. And I can remember leaving work one day. And my thing was to leave work and get me a beer for the ride home. And God spoke to me and said, turn your radio on 104.7. I got a song for you. I'm drinking my beer. I'm looking around. I mean, if you believe God never gives up. That's right. Ever. I turned that radio station on, and the song by Mercy Me came on called Beautiful. And so, see, I'm crying and drinking, and it didn't stop. But God never get up, never give up on me. During that time, my drinking became heavy and daily, and then heavy every day to the point I was staying buzzed or drunk. And God was steadily screaming to my heart, you're better than this. This isn't who I made you. You must preach my word to the lost and dying. And I can remember even on the drunk nights at my house, my wife would come to me and said, I know you're in there. What are you doing? God's going to use you. He's not done with you. But I couldn't see that. Thank God for a praying wife. <laughs> God's kept speaking, Jason, you're better than this. This isn't who I made you. I was weary and tired of the party and also had been let go of a job. So I was living at this time with someone else at my brother's house with no job. I'd been to jail, bonded out, and it was on probation. And let me just say it pays to listen to the Lord Amen. the first time. It says he chastens those that he loves, but I've been whipped by the Heavenly Father. And it's not pleasurable at all. So around the middle of the 1st of August, this was about in 2011, I got out of bed one morning on a Tuesday. The young lady I was living with had gone to work, and alcohol had almost got the best of me. I rolled out of bed, got on my knees, and asked God to help me. I was also feeling guilty about living with this lady. And so I began to pray. Lord, more than anything, I want your will for my life. And if this isn't who I'm supposed to marry, then sever this relationship and send me the wife that you have for me. See, it's very important in all our ways that we acknowledge him. Amen. And he will direct our paths. Understand that one of the reasons it was so hard for me, I felt, because the devil had lied to me. See, that's why it's it's a dangerous thing when you're weary to walk away from God. Because when you do that and you lay the word aside and you lay your prayer life aside, then you leave the door open for the enemy. Amen. And then when you do get in these temptations and you know, the Bible says no man is tempted by God, but he's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. So the more you dabble in these things of the world, then the less you're going to be able to hear the Father when he's screaming. Don't That's do right. that. Don't go there. It's 
Stop taking those pills. Why are you drinking? So I began praying for God to sever this relationship because when I wanted to do God's will, I wanted his will in that area too. But I was believing a lie. He said, you'll never be close to God again. You'll never preach again. After my prayer to God to sever that relationship, he did. I hadn't been to church in about eight years at this time, so I decided to go to the one that I used to go to in Powder Springs Trinity Chapel because I had friends there. And there's one in particular I was looking for was Carl and Jennifer Marshall, my wife. And so it had been, like I said, about 11 years. One Wednesday night I saw her during the greeting time. And Jennifer came and hugged me and I was like, where's Carl at? And then she told me the story that four years prior, or three and a half, what had happened that they weren't together anymore. So here I am, ready to get back in church, find me a Christian lady that loved God and just wanted to serve the Lord. And Jennifer sang. <laughs> That's right. So we went on our first date, September the 2nd, 2011, and got married January the 2nd, 2012. I hadn't fully, even at this time, surrendered all to the Lord. I was thankful, though, to have a beautiful lady as my wife that loved God and didn't party. We went to church together. See, back up for a second. The key point was surrendering all. I was trying to surrender a little bit. But I wanted to try to keep drinking in moderation. <laughs> the devil had a trap set. So the drinking picked up again a little bit, and then it got a lot. And it started up heavy again. And my rebelliousness set in a little at a time and caused many problems with the marriage that I just prayed for and that God gave me. I drank to try to numb the problem, and it only made it worse. Jennifer wasn't used to living with a drunk or a drinker, and June 2013, she'd had enough, and I moved out. I got a roommate over in Dallas, and I thought, this is it. I've tried to get back right. I've tried to do this. And, but there was a key thing I was missing here. I really wasn't surrendering my whole heart and will to God. I hadn't laid down my life. And when you don't do that, you leave a foothold for the enemy. I thought, this is it. The Lord is, he ain't going to use, I'm done. But God wouldn't give up. Jennifer's prayers, praying me back to health after diving head first back into the party scene in June, came against my spirit, was weary. I had got to the point of drinking on the job. My schedule is five days on and five off. And on my off days, I would drink, and I would drink so heavy that you know nobody wants to be shaking and throwing up. So to keep the DTs down, I would get me a six-pack of beer and a pint of vodka and put it in my bag at work, and I'd sip on it all night on the job. I was separated from the family that God gave me, and I was trying to drown the pain. And at this time, Jennifer was moving to Texas, and the relationship was about done. And I had been coming off this last time, a 10- to 15-day drinking binge, and was completely broken. I knew if I didn't seek God and repent and totally turn with my whole heart and make him Lord of my life, I wasn't going to be around long. I was drinking to the point where I didn't even want to wake up, didn't care. I would go out of town and go party with friends and Jennifer would call me just to check on me and pray and pray. And when I'd get back in town, she'd come cover me with love and prayers and vitamins and Pray me right back right. So I went back to church. She was in Texas. We were separated. August the 28th, 2013, completely broken in spirit 
and didn't want anything else but to feel my heavenly father's arms over me and just to know that he was still there. At this point, that's all I wanted. The pastor that night preached on deliverance, and I will never forget that night. When the altar call was given, I was the first one to hit the altar, and I had nothing to give to the Lord but a broken and abused vessel. And guess what? He took me back. He put me back on the potter's wheel because he's the potter, right? and we're the clay. So no matter what shape or what mess, if we're willing to take this lump of clay, put it back into the Lord's hands, he will remake and mold it. I came to Jesus, and God broke that addiction forever and set me free. Well, I went after my wife in prayer. I said, God gave me this family, and the devil's not going to have it. I got on my knees in prayer, and I'll never forget I was calling my wife in prayer, her spirit and her heart back to mine. And I bound everything, because Jesus gave us that power. That's what a lot of Christians don't know. He gave us power to bind and to loose. And I was binding spirits and hindering demons and everything. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I believe God's word over any circumstance Amen. over sin, sickness, addiction, and disease. And it was funny. I'll tell this little quick story. That Thursday night after I got delivered, I went to fasting and praying for my family to come home and for us to be reconciled. And I hadn't spoke to Jennifer in several days, probably a week. And on that Friday morning, she was supposed to get up and go to look for jobs. I found out on Sunday when I talked to her, she had got up that Friday morning confused, couldn't think straight, said she was taking a shower and almost fell over in the shower. The people she was with came in and said, are you okay? She's like, no, I don't understand, but I can't stay. I've got to go home. I know what that was. That was God restored my family. This is a testimony of hope and restoration and reconciliation. God totally healed and restored my marriage and family within about a week. I had to get my heart right and surrender to him. And now I walk as God's ambassador, full of the Holy Ghost and faith, and have but one goal and one purpose on this earth, to point souls to Jesus and see them saved, healed, and delivered. The biggest lie the enemy ever told me was I couldn't walk close to God again. Maybe he's told some of you that. Maybe he's told you you can't put them pills down. You can't stop watching pornography. You can't stop drinking or smoking or I don't know, whatever your addiction is. The biggest lie the enemy ever said was that God didn't love us. And he was finished. The devil is a liar. You're not here tonight by no accident. The word of God declares that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. It's not over for you. You're called of God to be a witness, to love people, and to serve them, and to walk this life of faith. And he heals you so you can go and bring healing to somebody else. Do you believe that? You have purpose and a destiny. Jesus said this. And I'm coming to a close. Because I want to pray. In Mark's gospel, if you have your Bible, in 16, 17, and 18, he says, And these attesting signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, that sickness doesn't necessarily have to be physical. You can be sin sick, disease sick, addiction sick. Christ is your only hope and your only answer.
The enemy will tell you he doesn't love you. He's a liar. He's the accuser of the brethren. Right. But aren't you glad Christ is alive? Amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, yes. today, and forever. Amen. Stand to your feet. One thing I love about this church is that the altars are always open. Just like in my home church, our altars are always open. If there's something in your life that you're ready to get out of and you can't do it any longer, you've tried your way, let me encourage you to lay it at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says, cast your burdens upon the Lord and he shall sustain you. Bow your heads. Father, in Jesus' name tonight, I bring this congregation before you. You know their hearts. You know what they're dealing with when they walk out of these doors. I bind every hindering spirit in the name of Jesus of Nazareth that would come against them in any way, form, or fashion. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to move through the congregation. Loose the bands of wickedness. Undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed Go free tonight. In Jesus' name, is there one that's lost? You Maybe you've never known the Lord. A backslider. Maybe you've known the Lord and went back on him and you want to come back home. This is your night. You're not promised tomorrow. The cemetery's full of people who thought they had another chance. Will you come? Those brothers will pray for you. I will pray with you. And we'll believe God with you to set you free and you'll leave changed.